Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much again for attending and welcome to our home. Hope you all had a wonderful holiday and uh, need to get back into the groove. So the lecture on my thoughts this week is on blessing, uh, singular. Actually, there are many blessings that uh, we are required to make. Some are connected to prayers, some to requests, and others to actions. There are also blessings referred to as blessings of enjoyment. They're called birchas nehenim. Uh, whenever we eat or drink anything, we are required to make a beginning and after blessing, a sort of please and thank you to God Almighty, whom we acknowledge as the owner of all that exists in the world. Now, there are specific beginning blessings for fruits, vegetables, pastries, bread, and all beverages, with the exception of wine. There are laws to determine the proper blessing for each item, but when in doubt, there is one blessing, that is, a, so to speak, blanket blessing that covers everything that we eat. The blessing that one can make is called a shahakol nihiyah bidvaro. That means that everything was created by his word. In the wording of creation, we read again and again, God said, let there be, and there was. As it states in Psalm 33, verse number 9, who Omar vayehi, he said, and it was. Everything. Everything was created by the word of God. Just by his speech alone, God was able to create this magnificent world, something from nothing. Now, since God created us in his image, we too were given the ability, so to speak, of speech. We are referred to as a medaber, one who speaks. God has endowed us through the power of speech also to have the ability to create and destroy worlds. You know, the story told about a king uh, who had an inc incurable skin disease. Doctors could find no way to help him. He was told by his astrologist, though, that they had seen in the stars that if he could bathe in the milk of a lioness, that he would be cured. Problem was, how and where could he attain the milk of a lioness? And so he put a call out to all of his knights in his kingdom, and one mighty knight came forward assuring the king that he would succeed in his quest. He asked only for seven sheep and promised to be back in ten days. And so the knight set out to find a lioness that had just given birth. He went deep into the forest, and sure enough, he soon found a cave with a lioness nursing her newborn cubs. The knight thought of a plan on how to gain the confidence of the lion, so that he would be able to get her milk for his king. So the first day, he tied a sheep a distance from the cave, and the lioness came out and took the sheep. And so each and every day, he placed the sheep closer and closer to the entrance of the cave, until the seventh day, he was standing right at the entrance of the cave. With great care and caution, he went over to the lioness and began stroking her body. As she lay there purring like a kitten, the knight took her milk and put it in a sack. He imagine he quickly hurried back to the palace, eager to give the king his treasure. And as he was riding back, in his mind, his body was having a discussion. His brain was bragging to all the other parts of his body about its ingenuity. Seven sheep, seven days. Brilliant. With that comment, the other parts of his body lined up to add their own comments. His legs said, ah, these are the legs that carried you all into the lioness's den. And the hand said, that may be true, but these are the hands, the fingers, that actually milk the udders of a lioness. And so as he traveled, the argument raged. As they were drawing near to the palace, the mouth said to all the other parts of the body, huh, I, I am the greatest. Well, with that comment, they all had a good laugh. They said, and they said, what, what do you have to do with any of this? The mouth said, just wait and see. Well, you can imagine the excitement in the palace when the word came that the knight had actually managed to acquire the milk of a lioness. Everyone, everyone was gathered as the knight entered pride proudly, displaying his pouch filled with lioness milk. He bowed before the king and he said, Your Highness, I present you with a pouch filled with dog milk. There was this deafening silence. 
dog milk. Hmm. The king had the knight immediately taken to the dungeon, and he was sentenced to be hung. While the knight was lying in his cell, <laughs> the silence was broken by his mouth. It addressed the other parts of his body. It said, I, you know, I don't hear anyone bragging anymore about how great they are. Well, I said I'm the greatest part of the body, and now I'm going to prove it. I got us into this predicament, and now I'm going to get us out. He called the guard and told him that it was urgent that he speak with the king immediately. And they took the knight before the king, and he said, Your Highness, you know that I come originally from a, a foreign land, and in my native tongue, the word for lioness and your word for dog are exactly the same. I'm so sorry for the misunderstanding, but I'm sure that if the king will bathe in the milk, he'll be totally healed. Uh, the power of the mouth. The after blessing that we recite covers even more items than does the beginning blessing. There are only three after blessing thank yous of sort for food. The only blessing that's Torahic is what we refer to as the Birchat Hamazon, known as the grace after meal. This blessing is recited after eating any bread made from the five grains, wheat, barley, rye, spelt, or oats. Then there is the blessing referred to loosely as the Alamichya, for the produce of the field. This blessing is recited after eating any pastries made from the five grains that I mentioned. This after blessing is also recited after partaking of wine, and or the five species of fruit that Israel is best known for, grapes, figs, dates, pomegranates, and olives. The beginning and end of the blessing could change depending on what one has eaten, but the main body of the blessing is constant, remains the same. The third such blessing is, a, so to speak, a universal after blessing. It's called the Berei Nefashot Rabot Pechesronon. He who creates many souls, this after blessing is said, after anything or everything else that one has eaten. There is no distinction between food or beverage. This blessing covers it all. An all-encompassing statement of gratitude for the sustenance that God Almighty provides us daily. An acknowledgement that everything belongs to Him and follows His will. Uh, let's look at the wording of this blessing and see what we learn from it. The blessing begins with the standard wording of all blessing, Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Olam. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. The rest of the wording of the blessing teaches us about God and life in this world. He continues with the words, Borei nefoshos rabos, He created many souls, Bechesronon al kolmashe barasa, and imbued each one with their own deficiencies, addictions. So the question has to be, why? Why would he create all of us with deficiencies? And the answer, to instill within them, within us, an enthusiasm for life. Blessed is he who gives life to his worlds. What this blessing is really telling us is that everyone, everyone is created with a challenge, a chesronon, a deficiency, if you will, an addiction. No one's perfect. Perfection is something that we strive for, something that we earn. If what God wanted was perfection, he didn't need to create man. He already had angels. It would seem that God, like any parent, takes special pride in watching his imperfect children striving to be the best that they can be, overachievers. So why did God create us with deficiencies? Blessing continues, explains the Hakayos Bahem Nefeshkochai, to instill within them, within us, an enthusiasm for life. Why would deficiencies create an enthusiasm for life? For whatever reason known to God, he, he created us in a way that we learn to appreciate things by contrast, by experiencing the opposite light versus darkness, hot versus cold, up versus down, happiness versus sadness, men versus women, on and on. Think of a heart monitor, peaks and valleys. The lower the valleys, the higher the peaks. As long as there are peaks and valleys, the person is healthy. If the line stops moving up and down and just goes straight across, well, that is called flatlining. Your heart is no longer pumping. Sad news. 
you are dead. Time to lie down. So opposites, ups and downs are a national phenomenon of living. God created us all with challenges. He has done so so that we can truly feel the joy and satisfaction that one attains when they have conquered the greatest challenge in life, ourselves. Overcoming our deficiencies, our addictions, is that which gives us the truest sense of living. Why do some people become mercenaries, risk takers, daredevils? Why do we watch horror, horror movies or ride a roller coaster? Answer, because in that moment when your life is on the line, when you feel like you are staring death in the face, that rush of adrenaline gives a person the greatest feeling of life. Many times those born into wealthy and powerful families find that even more challenging than those who are born into poverty. When everything is given to you, it can rob you of the feeling of satisfaction that one receives when striving and succeeding. This may well be that everything is the feel, feeling of everything coming to you. They have little appreciation. Nothing really has any real value. You know, there's a story told of a robber shot in the middle of a holdup. He wakes up, but he's totally confused, disoriented. The last thing he remembered is being shot. He feels his body, no bullet holes, no blood. He looks around the room, no windows or door. But then suddenly, a door appears and an old man walks in. He has a long white beard. He naturally, the robber naturally asks the old man, where am I? The old man replied, it's not important now. What can I do for you? He says, well, I'm a little hungry. Do uh, you have any good restaurants here, uh, booze, women? Is there any casinos? The old man says, no problem. And he has the time of his life. The food is excellent. The booze is unbelievable. The women, gorgeous. The casino, can't stop winning. He has a great night. But then, next thing he knows, he wakes up. And there he is back in the bed in that room. No door, no windows. And then suddenly the old man appears through the door. And again, his first question, where am I? And the old man again says, not important. What can I do for you? He says, well, there's, uh, again, I'm still hungry. Any other restaurants and booze and women? Is there a bank I can hold up? A casino? Again, has the time of his life. Next thing he knows, he's in, wakes up in the bed. And again, no door, no windows, but the old man appears. And this goes on. And then finally, one day, the robber looks at the old man when he enters and he says, I know where I am. The old man says, where? He says, I'm in hell. The old man shakes his head and says, you're right. Much like this primordial snake, God gave him everything. That he would eat from the dust of the earth. There's always dust in the earth, but it's tasteless. And he would never have connection with God again. He was given the greatest punishment of all, to be totally removed from God, to have a life without anything being different, nothing, nothing tasting well. So those that are born into poverty have only one direction to move, up. There's a joke that says you can hard to commit suicide jumping out of a basement window. So since they have little, they appreciate any and all things that they receive. Life has taught them to always look forward. They've come to realize that it's precisely the valleys, the difficulties, the challenges in our lives that give us the peaks, our joys and satisfaction. In fact, the lower the valley, the higher the peak. They tell the story of Thomas J. Watson Sr. He served as CEO of IBM from 1914 to 1956. He had a reputation of being a tough and animated leader. There was a story told of a salesman who had cost the company millions of dollars. Realizing his blunder, the man tendered his in his vet resignation. He signed the document, put it in an envelope, and handed it to Watson. While expressing his deepest and most sincere regrets, he turned to leave, a broken man. Before he could exit Watson's office, he heard Watson call out to him in a loud voice, where do you think you're going? I just spent millions of dollars on your education. Do you think that I'm going to let someone else benefit from that knowledge? You're not going anywhere. Get back to work. Many people are so afraid of failure 
that they deprive themselves of the joy of success. In Judaism, we believe in what is called a yurida for an aliyah, so to speak, bending down so as to jump higher. You know, when I've talked to an employee that has made a mistake that may have cost them a raise or a higher position, many times they just give up. They focus on the negative. I say to them, if I ask you to jump, what's the first thing that you're going to do? They usually reply, jump. I say, no, no. First thing that you're going to do is to bend down. The lower you bend, the higher you'll be able to jump. You just bent down. Now it's time for you to seize the opportunity and jump as high as you can. Giving up is never an option. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So too in life. Growing up in poverty, abuse, and difficulties are all outside factors. They do not define who you are. Where you are can easily be corrected. Who you are is much more of a challenge. Changing who you are or becoming those deficiencies, those addictions, challenges that God has created us with, is the basis of life. It's called growth. This may be why many commentaries believe that the tree of knowledge was a grape. There are few things in this world that are not subject to the ravages of time. Grapes, or wine, is one of the few things that actually improve with time, and so to knowledge. With each day we accumulate more and more, and with that knowledge we gain more and more wisdom. As the saying goes, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, or in our situation, the grape from the tree of knowledge. Everyone, even the greatest of all men, Moshe Rabbeinu, was born with a deficiency. And with all due respect, Moshe's challenge was ego. One could wonder about my statement. After all, God himself testifies in the Torah that Moshe was Ish Anav Ma'od, the humblest of all men. Exactly. That is the proof. The reason why the Torah mentions Moshe's praise is because he worked on his negative trait, his deficiency, and turned it into a positive. After all, he was brought up as a prince in the house of Pharaoh. The measure says he was the king of Ethiopia for 40 years. And then he was the king of the Jewish nation for another 40 years. Ego. It comes with the job. This is why the term mentions his humility, as it states in Pirkei Avos, chapter 4, Mishnah 1. Ben Zoma said, Eza HaGibur, who is strong? Al Kovish es Yitzra, one who conquers his nature. Since the only one that really knows who a person really is, at his core, is God Almighty. It was God, he, who could testify to Moshe's Herculean feat of totally negating his deficiency in life. Eish Anav Ma'od, the humblest of all men. Not only was he able to overcome his deficiency, he turned his negative into a positive. From Moshe we learn another important connection in deficiencies, addictions. The one thing that makes us all human is our deficiencies. The fact that we have our own challenges helps us to sympathize and accept deficiencies in others. We're all human. No one is perfect. It is our deficiencies that allow us to understand and have compassion for one another, to truly feel another person's pain, to empathize. Moshe had reached such a high spiritual elevation that he could no longer connect with the needs of the average normal people. The people asked for water. They had gone three days without water. They asked for water for their children and for their animals. Moshe got angry. He was no longer able to identify with real people. And again, their basic needs. He had spent 40 days on the mountain on three different occasions with God Almighty. He neither ate nor did he drink during those 120 days. The measure states that he was an angel from the waist up and a person from the waist down. He had lost contact with the people. He could no longer lead them. A leader must be able to be a part of the people in order to understand their needs. He must be human in order to understand their wants. Only then will he be able to lead them on the proper path. As we say in the Modim prayer, three times daily, the standing prayer, 
and all those that are living will thank you. The Hebrew word for Chaim, life, is an acronym for the four possible life-threatening situations that one is required to say a special prayer for when one has safely experienced them. In the time of the temple, one would bring a korban toda, a thanks offering. Today, we bench Goma. We say a blessing thanking God for his salvation, and the congregation answers in the affirmative, and then they respond in unison with the request for additional blessings for the person involved. You know, the Hebrew word letters of the Hebrew word chayim, life, are chet, which alludes to the Hebrew word chola, a sick person, one who's recovered from a serious illness. Yud, which alludes to the Hebrew word yamim, sea, one who survived an ocean voyage. The next yud, which alludes to the Hebrew word yisurim, difficulties, incarceration, one who's just been released from prison. And the last letter mem, which alludes to the Hebrew word midbor, desert, one who has just safely crossed a vast desert. All of these scenarios involve danger, a time of great trepidation. They involve a real possibility of injury or death. And when we have experienced these types of situations and have survived, we feel a true necessity to be joyous. We are riding high on life. Life has become a little more precious, a little sweeter. We celebrate life. The word Chaim life has a numerical value of 68. This numerical value is the same number of letters, and including the verse itself in the first prayer of request in the Amida, the standing prayer. You give to man wisdom. The only way that we can benefit from our deficiencies, from our addictions, is to first recognize that we have a challenge. We then pray to God to help us, to have the wisdom to choose the proper path will allow us to live and even grow with our weaknesses, turning our weaknesses into strengths. At the same time, our deficiencies should give us a sense of compassion for others and the difficult challenge that they have to face themselves. You know, I played racquetball for many years and actually got pretty good. It seemed that the forehand is a more natural swing, a gift from God, so to speak. However, my backhand, <laughs> my backhand was a disaster. So I spent hours and thousands of shots on, my, on the court by myself, practicing my backhand. Well, it worked. I developed a devastating shot. If you could see my face every time I hit my backhand, you would see one big smile. I earned it. Just to finish the story and a lesson for life, the person that I played racquetball with for years was also a good player and smart. So when he saw how good and consistently I was making my backhand, he just adjusted his game. And he would run up to the wall every time he saw me set up for my backhand. He positioned himself only two feet from the wall. And then he took my great shot and turned it into an easy win. So then I had to go back to my old shot and bring the ball back and higher. The challenges of life. We always need to continue to grow, to learn, we don't have the option to give up. So, welcome to the train of life. Anyone can ride. All you need is a desire to live, to love, and to laugh. And with that thought, may God bless us with the ultimate blessing of the coming of Mashiach to Canaan quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening, and uh, I hope you found the lecture interesting. God bless you. Have a great week. Be healthy. Be safe. And God should bless you with only good. Thank you again for listening.